Their body radiance, like the moon, wanders in the cool wind. The song of Lord Kital, sweet girl, standing on the mountain. Your teeth are like jewels, light in the lotus of your eyes. Talk to me gently of your heart. I am Lord Sangapala. I wrote this song. We spoke, but they did not answer. Those ladies of the mountain, they did not give us the twitch of an eyelid. This is a rather imposing mass of granite that rises some 200 meters into the sky here in these north central plains of the island of Sri Lanka. And uh, it is remarkable that there is little else around here to match this kind of structure. But then as one realizes that this is the focal point of a remarkable urban community that existed perhaps at its zenith in the fifth century of our common era and that within a period not quite 20 years this whole place was converted to be a resplendent complex of uh, city gardens um, and high art well then one must recognize that this is an enigma Kashapa is the central character in this rather amazing drama and uh, he has forever captured the imagination of countless generations of visitors to this place through the centuries. And yet one must ask, is this just the work of a patricidal pretender through the throne after having killed his father? Datusena the first of Anuradhapura. Now what sort of man would have the vision to secure this granite outpost of his father's kingdom and transform the entire precinct into a formidable monument that perhaps deserves to be considered as one of the wonders of the ancient world, perhaps the eighth one. <music> This which is behind me and all around is another example of the pleasure gardens. Now this area would have had features, the central theme of which would have been water and water courses. And so around these areas are what are called islands and summer houses. For what purpose they were erected and how they were used, of course, uh, one can only estimate at this time but we would imagine that uh, this was a royal preserve and not necessarily an area which was visited often by the people, the citizens of the kingdom. But this would have been an area that was designated for royal visitors and the royal family and the court. At periods other than when this was used as a citadel, it is anybody's guess as to what this might have been, but lovely nevertheless. <laughs> looks in this area of the pleasure gardens one cannot help but be impressed by the level of knowledge that must have existed back in the fifth century with regard to water management now while there's a great deal of water here the source the source of the springs is not entirely evident so there has to be an ingenious system of underground ducting that brings all of this water and wastes not a drop of it and perhaps in these 
beautifully arranged water courses and it is only an aesthetic there's no other rationale for this except that it is aesthetic in this management we notice that they have also the fountains now in the dry season these fountains may not be flowing with water but uh, in the wet season when there is a little more water pressure from the sources the water begins to erupt from these ancient fountains which is a very interesting thing so if you were to imagine back then when this was in its glory it must have looked very pretty indeed all of this water here's another example of those islands with a summer house on top well alas the summer house is no more to be seen we reckon it might have been a wooden structure which through the ages has withered and disappeared and this which I indicate would have been the area full of water which is why this is an island beautiful here's another example of very imaginative aesthetics not symmetrical this is not in any logical form but uh, this is a water course and there would have been a flowing body of water coursing through here and ending up at the gully at the further end why well just looks pretty I guess that's the only rationale for building it and uh, making it flow this way This here is the western entrance to the inner city but it is worth mentioning that this whole area the inner city that part of the kingdom has been secured with a moat an inner wall and an outer wall but this western entrance here would have been an ornate entryway now it may be guessed that in early days this would have been a wooden structure which also incorporated some stonework but in this day and age that fifth century construction does not exist anymore but this western entrance allows one to access what has been termed the pleasure gardens at the ground level and the citadel part of this Sigiri complex was of course further up and on top of the rock now what is very special about the pleasure gardens is that in as much as there are areas designated uh, with gardens that's flora and foliage there are also areas which have been termed water gardens for a very good reason as we shall see in a moment but these pleasure gardens are arranged in the most spectacular geometrical patterns with an amazing symmetry now if we were to place a grid on this you would recognize that all of this falls into a particular pattern and some are reminded of the gardens in France in Versailles yes that is the kind of expertise that must have existed in those ancient days in the fifth century and perhaps even before that here is an example of the water gardens and a very good one now this was not just a pool but this was an area where there was movement of water and it is thought that there were certain gradients here and certain types of pebble and sand that was placed at the different levels the water in motion over those different types of earth and the stone created a distinct sound a sound aesthetic and it is believed that this was what made the water gardens very special movement of water over different types of terrain 
and of course since there were different levels you would imagine that the sound of the water was particularly melodious to the ears and in certain areas in the midst of this water garden were pavilions and we can imagine that there were visitors and guests of the royal court and even members of the royal court who would sit of an evening and look at the rock and enjoy the beauty of the rock even as they did the immediate surroundings around and about them. Today those pavilions are not to be seen but when we take a closer look at those higher levels one can see where those pillars might have been inserted to support the pavilion. Now here is yet another example of a water garden developed somewhat differently to those areas where we observed previously the water flowing across different types of pebbles and different types of earthen terrain. These are deeper pools but what is rather special about these ancients who created these things is that in as much as there are structures built great care has been taken not to temper with the natural geology of this location. So if there are little outcrops of rock, they remain unblasted and unremoved. They have been bent to be part of this whole aesthetic. And that is rather special, that care has been taken not to disturb what might be termed the natural environment. And rather interestingly, there's a little aperture there that serves as an entrance to the area where this deeper pool is. Some people think that this was an aperture that granted access to the royal family, unseen by those about, where they would be able to come and bathe in these pools at certain times during the day. But one never really knows for sure. But that is what people do say. The architects and engineers who perhaps worked with King Kashipa to develop this wonderful garden complex could very well have eliminated that rock to make way for the pool or make it uh, complete in its symmetry. But what is interesting is that rather than destroy the rock that does exist, the flow of water from the streams and uh, springs underneath um, they have been allowed to flow through and above the rock and a groove was cut on the rock and when this pool area is full it's rather beautiful to see the water cascading down from the groove. As we approach the western face of the Seagiria rock just down below on the ground level we find a rather interesting feature an octagonal pool. What this pool was used for, no one really knows. There are people who estimate that this might have been a special pool for the queens of the court, the ladies of the court, and that it was possible for people from up above to take a look at what was happening down below. But then, that's just guesswork. But what is rather special and there is still evidence that it must have been so, pavilions were erected round and about here. Why? Well, we don't really know, but if we are able to appreciate that this whole locality was devoted to the aesthetic, then these pavilions might have just served as places where people would be able to look out and enjoy the view. Today, no pavilions are to be seen, but the indentations on the rock help us to realize that foundation stones have been laid upon which there would have been these structures back in the 5th century or thereabout. Here now is evidence that there was in this locality something outside the artistic intent of a fugitive king. 
This is a religious structure, the remains of a stupa, which has allowed archaeologists to believe that this locality, right by the side of the western face of Sigiriya rock, would in ancient times, even before the 5th century, have been a, a religious area, meaning a monastic complex. And this is one such bit of evidence. We have just crossed the threshold to what has been termed the Boulder Garden for self-evident reasons. In this particular area, just before the ascent to the top of the rock begins, there are several natural features which have been incorporated into this overwhelming aesthetic. But mind you, it is thought that this boulder garden was in fact part of the original monastic complex which predated the Kashyap period in the 5th century. And even as earlier on we were able to spot a stupa, there are many more of such relic houses to be found within the boulder garden. And what is rather interesting is that these, these natural phenomena have become part of a, a kind of a landscaped arrangement. Who thought it up? We don't know. This is just one of several caves that are to be found within this Sigiriya complex. It is thought that this was the abode of a meditating monk. Now, what is perhaps interesting with regard to this particular cave and yet others too, is that there is a drip ledge and just below and underneath the drip ledge was plaster on which was found frescoes, paintings. This cave is somewhat unique. There is a dedicate T and the inscription up on the rock helps us to know who it was. And this has been dated as being the 3rd century BC to the monastic complex occupied this territory even before it became the citadel of the fugitive King Kashyapa. And what is interesting also is that there are on the side of the cave the paintings. And this one in particular has the color blue upon it. None of the other paintings that are to be seen on the plaster shows evidence of the use of blue, but this one does. And considering the age, we might uh, be rather surprised at how they arrived at that particular pigment to be used on the plaster. Now here we find some very beautiful geometric patterns that have been created on the plaster. These are earth colours. Yep. Within this area of the Boulder Garden is a rather compelling sight and I'm now in the shadow of what is called the Cobra Hood Cave. A quick look at it and you realize why it is called that. And it is underneath the bend of this particular cave that we find this inscription indicating as to which of the lords of the 3rd century BC was there reposited within the space underneath. <music> Here's another very interesting feature found in more than one place. Two rocks adjacent to each other and leaning one on the other, <laughs> providing an interesting aperture, a gateway to pass by. Yep.
On our upward climb along the western face of the Seagiri Rock, just above the Boulder Garden, one encounters what is known as the terraced gardens. Terraced gardens on the side of a rock face. Most interesting. But that's exactly what it was. Nowadays, there are plenty of trees and foliage and uh, we can only but guess at what it might have looked like with all of the flowers that they would have planted along these terraces. If the handiwork of ancient King Nebuchadnezzar with his building of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon might be counted as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, you do think about what kind of rating you might afford this extravagance of purpose and design. The copper colored band that we were able to observe at the lower level, which graced the side of the mountain or the Sigiri rock, well, this is it, the inner perspective of it. It's called the mirror wall because of the surface having a gloss on it. And what is very interesting is that in the centuries, even after the period of Kashapa, visitors to this location or pilgrims have noted down quite often in verse their feelings, their own poetic expression. This is known as the Sigiri Graffiti and has been a subject of deep study, first deciphered by Dr. Senarat Paranavitana and now available for reference hundreds and thousands of expressions, all in poetic verse. This is the de facto entrance to the citadel, also referred to as the lion's paw entrance. Now, all that remains for us to see is the lion's paw, but if it was intended to imitate the view of a lion, then one can imagine from the indentations found just above the lion's paw, that there must have been an enormous structure up above and there might even have been the visage of a lion looking outward and interestingly this is due north the lion was looking out due north just in front of the lion's paw entrance one does see the remnant of some sort of structure so these may have been anterooms or some sort of area which was under cover and permitted entry through the lion's paw into the citadel. Up above was thought to be the residence of the fugitive king. After the laborious climb up to the summit of Sigiriya, the labor is all worth it. That's exactly how one feels. Well, it's very difficult to match this vista. But far more than that, the archaeological and historical value of this summit is inestimable. The summit here is thought to be about 1.5 hectares of ground space, but at different levels. Here too, somewhat similar to the pleasure gardens and water gardens down below at the ground level, here too, there are beautiful areas that have been set apart for pleasure inasmuch as this is the inner sanctum that would have been used by King Kashapa. His palace complex is right there and we see the remnants of that. We are able to see the embankments and um, the buttressed walls that still exist to this date. What the structure 
appeared like on top of the summit is very difficult to say with any guarantee at this time, but it is interesting to try and imagine what it must have looked like. And being the aesthete that he was, one can be certain that just as much as the bottom level was breathtaking in his beauty, this too, making full use of this wonderful vista that one is afforded from this level. About 360 meters up in the sky from mean sea level. It is difficult to imagine what this would really have looked like, but certainly it's quite a challenge to our imagination. And in the period after the vanquishing of King Kashapa, just before the turn of the century, at the end of the 5th century, this area in the summit, the palace complex, everything would have gone into disuse. Inasmuch as the lower levels resumed its uh, monastic activity, the upper structure would have been neglected. And so with the passage of time, the timbers and the structures that supported whatever was up here has disappeared from view. However, we can be thankful that what remains is still sufficient for us to be able to ascertain what kind of glory existed here back in the 5th century. And it is no surprise at all then to understand why it is that UNESCO has decided to recognize this as one of the wonders of the ancient world. In fact, it is UNESCO who have provided the government of Sri Lanka to undertake an enormous restoration and conservation project which continues to this date and uh, it is perhaps no surprise at all why it is that large sums of money need to be collected regularly to be able to maintain all of this in the way that it is now available for all visitors to see. And it is hoped that more archaeological evidence will turn up as the scholarship continues into this area and the surrounding complex for indeed in South Asia this is one of the most ancient monuments that exists providing us a glimpse into the past. This rock bath or pool is further evidence provided that there must have been a great knowledge of hydraulic engineering back in the fifth century. Even today this rock pool in the driest hottest months of the year remains filled with water. Now, as for the reason, well, one might do some guesswork, but during the rainy season, this does fill up quite a bit, but the water never runs dry. This is one of the significant locations in this palace complex up here at the summit. People have got used to referring to this as the throne well, Divan perhaps is more accurate because this indeed was a theatre. Probably the king was reclining here with his royal consorts and being able to observe performances being uh, enacted just below this level or even at this level. And uh, what we have today at the various levels helps us to appreciate the organisation that must have existed at, at that time, in the 5th century, to be able to use all of this. Even though the Divan at this time is open to the elements, it certainly was not so always, because there is evidence that this would have had a covering, a canopy, uh, that rested above the Divan. And also there is 
a lot of evidence, as we said, of organization. We notice also a little ledge that has been carved into the stone here to allow the water, the rainwater, to pass through along this little drain and move on out rather than splash the whole area with its dampness. So here we are, we are able to notice that ledge and the way the water has been managed and it now goes through and out without any hindrance. And so there again, we are able to appreciate that even in its minute details, this area bespeaks of great organization. Okay. And we are able to notice here that even on the side of this divan, there has been a little groove cut to allow the water to drip through or seep through rather than dampen the divan. But now here we have evidence <laughs> of uh, some dampness here and that is only because in the passage of time there has been a chipping of the rock for some reason and therefore there is a leak and so it drips down here. But uh, when this was in use back in the 5th century, this would not have been a phenomenon that was to be seen. Rather, it would have remained dry even when the rain began to fall. Just behind me here would be the inner sanctum, the palace of the king. Well, all we have is just the foundation and we can ascertain its size and imagine its glory. This is at the level of the Boulder Garden that we find a rather interesting phenomenon. We might think of this as a ceremonial cistern or a royal bath for ceremonial ablutions. There are some steps leading into it, but we do surmise that um, there would have been a covering, some sort of edifice to mark this spot and the roof certainly would have adorned this ceremonial bath. And just below this, on another boulder, is found an audience chamber. And there we find, existing to this date, something that we might very well describe as a throne. But that too is a very large divan. And it is thought that here, royal ceremonies were conducted. And uh, it is interesting to note that here too, there has been mention paid to the management of water. Nothing was allowed to go waste, nothing was allowed to disturb the natural beauty of this location with indiscriminate dispersal of waste water. In this area which we have described as the Boulder Garden, this is the only spot and location where there has been an alteration to the natural contours of the boulder. This is the only location where there has been some serious engineering done on the rock face to alter it to serve the purpose of the royal court. 